Okay, so it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Leonid Chetanevich, our speaker tonight, uh, who is a, a new uh, faculty at the, in the School of Computing Sciences at Fulham University. Um, I've known Leonid for 10 years now because when I was a faculty at the University of Quebec, he was a high school student, and we welcome very we welcome very uh, good high school students in our lab. And then, then he, he was one of these interns we had the summer, and, and we were all impressed. We thought he would have a great career in, in pure math. And um, he decided to change field and to go into computational biology with Mathieu Blanchet in McGill, then in, at MIT and Harvard. And uh, finally, he's uh, landing up here in Vancouver at Simon Fraser University. And he's doing some really exciting thing about um, bioinformatics and epidemiology and pathogens that he's going to describe today. So please welcome with me, uh, Leonid. So just this way? Okay. Oh, okay. So I, I need to be able to see myself. Great. All right. Well, thanks very much, Cedric and uh, Will, for giving this opportunity to present here. And uh, I'm happy to uh, talk to you all about my work on modeling infectious disease epidemics today. So I will um, just give you a brief outline to start with. OK, that worked. Great. Um, so I'll start by giving a little bit of background. And I'm going to talk to you about my work on modeling uh, infectious disease epidemics and primarily tuberculosis. Um, on several different scales, several different levels. So I'll start with um, looking at a population level model um, and the Bayesian analysis to understand the uh, TB HIV co-epidemic in South Africa. And then I'll go on to explore some molecular epidemiology data, which is data that we can collect during an epidemic by sequencing uh, pathogens, so uh, the bugs that cause disease, and we'll talk about classification of complex infections, again, in tuberculosis. And then I'll tell you a little bit about some mechanistic modeling that I've done, uh, which is uh, about uh, trying to understand the emergence uh, of drug resistance and trying to uh, figure out how to kind of get around it. And then I'll tell you a little bit of a big picture uh, you know, vision at the end, which is about you know, how we can build these multi-scale models of infection. I'm not going to talk a lot about um, infectious disease um, sort of background because um, I guess the first speaker here, uh, Fiona Brinkman, did a really great, uh, fantastic job of kind of setting the context. And so I'll uh, go right into the specifics, starting with uh, TV. So uh, now that these uh, technical difficulties have sorted out, let me tell you a little bit about tuberculosis, or TB, uh, which continues to be a major public health problem uh, around the world, and I'll show you where the burden is concentrated, but uh, there's about 9 million new cases every year and about 1.5 uh, million, million deaths every year, and it's a disease that has a very high risk of death if it's left untreated. On the other hand, we do have very effective treatment for it, but uh, more, most recently, we've had a lot of problems with the emergence of uh, drug-resistant forms, so bacteria that do not respond to the drugs that we uh, try to treat it with. And so there is actually uh, two stages to the infection. There is the latent infection stage, which is actually the case for about a third of the world's population. So about 2.1 billion people in the world are infected with the latent, latent form. But it is not um, you know, a major problem for the majority of people. Only a few of the people who do get exposed to tuberculosis go on to develop an active form of the infection. And this is usually due to some kind of uh, immune suppression. So uh, if the immune system is down, um, you know, could be a variety of causes, malnutrition, uh, HIV AIDS is a big one, of course, um, could be a number of other things. Uh, then the pathogen suddenly wakes up and starts replicating like crazy and becomes uh, active. And then there's also at that point, potential for transmission to other people by the respiratory route. So this is a map where the uh, areas are scaled with respect to their burden of tuberculosis rather than their usual area. So you can see that some areas are much larger than you would expect, and some areas are much smaller than you would expect. And that's just because you know that's where the burden of the disease primarily is. So sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 
a lot of Asian countries, some in South, South America as well, um, not so much um, over here. And if we look at the worldwide epidemic, it's been, you know, fairly uh, steadily declining, slowly but steadily declining, uh, no matter what uh, factor you look at. But if you look at South Africa specifically, which is the region that I uh, started out by being interested in, it's actually been on the rise. And the big reason for that is HIV. So HIV has really kind of fueled the rise of the um, tuberculosis epidemic. And uh, both the incidence, so the number of new cases, as well as the prevalence, the number of total cases, have been on the rise. Uh, mortality has started to decline again, uh, but you know, fairly slowly still. So the main question of the first part of the talk is going to be how do we uh, make improvements to the two programs. So ART, which stands for antiretrovirals, which are basically the drugs that you give uh, patients with HIV to control their HIV, and TB treatments. So how do we improve those uh, individually and in combination in order to control the tuberculosis epidemic, uh, primarily in Southern Africa? And this was a question that was uh, posed to us by the HIV modeling uh, consortium that our group was part of, and we developed a model to answer this question. The entire exercise involved 12 different groups that each came up with 12, you know, well, each came up with a different model, and then we kind of tried to synthesize all the model predictions together. But I'll show you the one that um, I helped develop, uh, and this was published uh, earlier this year in Interface. So the model looks something like this, where we have a bunch of compartments, and every compartment has four different labels. And so the labels can reflect the tuberculosis status of the person. So either they're susceptible initially or latently infected um, or have gone on to develop active TB, which could be smear positive or smear negative, smear microscopy being the main tool, uh, diagnostic tool that is used to detect uh, tuberculosis. So depending on whether it's sort of easily detectable or uh, difficult to detect, we might have different outcomes. And then some of the people get treated, and uh, if they get treated, they can get treated on DOTS, which stands for Directly Observed Therapy Short Course, or they can get treated uh, with uh, a non-standard program. We also keep track of uh, treatment history, so is the person uh, somebody who has been treated before, or is it their first time? We keep track of resistance, so again, starting out in a sensitive um, compartment, so the strain response to all the drugs, and then it can go on to develop resistance to one of the two drugs, isoniazid and rifampicin, that are used uh, as primary drugs for uh, treating tuberculosis. It can become resistant to both, uh, in which case we talk about multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, and then it can even go further in terms of resistance and become extensively drug resistant, so XDRTV. And we also have uh, HIV status that we track, so initially, everybody starts out being HIV negative, so no HIV. And then um, if they get infected, then there's a progression through um, from higher to lower CD4 counts. CD4 counts are counts of CD4 cells that uh, tell us how well the immune system is working. So the fewer you have, the worse off you are, in, and the worse off your prognosis is. And then at any of these uh, statuses, you can start uh, treatment on ART, antiretroviral treatment and then um, you get better, and you also transmit less. So all the compartments in this model, and there's about 500 of them, have transitions, and these transitions are parameterized by a number of parameters. And in order to calibrate this model to data that we have, basically trying to see whether the model can reproduce uh, the past uh, trajectory of the epidemic, we do something called um, sampling importance resampling, and that's a Bayesian technique. And what it does is it allows us to reconcile the runs of the model, uh, the projections of the model, with historical data. So you can see here, uh, we start out with um, basically trajectories that are all over the place relative to um, what we know actually happened. And then after we do the calibration, then you know, the majority of them are more or less in line with the um, actual trajectory of the epidemic as um, um, according to data collected by the World Health Organization. The same thing we can do with other indicators, such as 
the prevalence of multidrug resistant tuberculosis among treatment patients, uh, where we have this data point. And so again, most of the trajectories end up being fairly close to the actual um, value. And so this allows us to make sure that the parameters that we use or the parameter vectors that we look into are going to create uh, model trajectories that are consistent with what we know of the history. And of course, we don't know history uh, after 2015, so that's where we're going to project, and we're going to look at both short-term outcomes and long-term outcomes. And when we look at outcomes, you know, the picture can look something like this. So we can look at the status quo, which is, you know, not doing anything, and basically TB incidence remains pretty much flat um, after 2015, so there's not much that happens. Uh, so the number of new cases doesn't really change very much if everything is left to evolve as uh, it currently does. However, we can intervene both on the tuberculosis side as well, on the, uh, as, well as on the uh, HIV side. So those are the green and the black lines respectively. So you can see that tuberculosis interventions um, do a lot of good early on and then they kind of plateau, whereas the um, HIV interventions keep uh, decreasing the incidence uh, uh, more and more over time. And then if you do both of these things, then of course you get the biggest effect. And then you can look at the same picture for mortality. And so interestingly for mortality, intervening on the tuberculosis side or on the HIV side is about the same uh, in the long run. And again, doing both is better than doing the individual things. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, this uh, project, of course, there's um, a lot more details. You can find the paper. I also have some extra slides in case you're uh, interested in exploring more details, but what this project allows us to do is to essentially see how we believe the epidemic is going to evolve according to different possible interventions. So whether we improve the tuberculosis treatment program, what kind of outcomes can we expect, whether we improve um, the eligibility and the access that people have to enter retroviral treatment, uh, those who are uh, HIV positive, and what are the comparable effects. So this is one kind of model that is basically population level, compartmental models, uh, and uh, analyzed using Bayesian statistics. Now, the second project that I'll talk about is about fingerprinting microbacteria. And what this is now going to talk about is gen genomic data, right? So this is genomic data that we can extract from individual strains and look at individual patients and see what they're actually infected with, right? So this is much more um, patient level kind of analysis. And we are in particular going to be interested in something called complex infections, which is the situation where a single patient is infected by multiple um, different strains. And one of the main ways of genotyping tuberculosis, so of course now we have the capability to do whole genome sequencing but until recently, the dominant way of genotyping uh, tuberculosis genomes was uh, to look at something called VNTR loci. And those are essentially microsatellites, so short genomic regions that repeat. So the TR stands for tandem repeats, and VN stands for variable number. So there's variable numbers of tandem repeats at every locus. And looking at how many repeats we have at every locus gives us some information about what the strain is, and how it relates to anything that we might observe in other um, patients in our population. So for example, here we have these four loci, A, B, C, and D, and we just count how many copies do we have of this particular uh, repeated region at every uh, location. So here we have four, here we have three, two, and five, right? So the string 4325 is a fingerprint of uh, the particular strain infecting the particular patient. And we can now start asking some questions <clears throat> about this information, right? And one question in particular that um, I was interested in, and again, this is within the context of a study done in South Africa where there's a lot of HIV and there's a lot of tuberculosis as well. We often see people who are infected by multiple strains. So not one strain, but many strains. And when we see that happen, there's actually two ways in which that can happen if we're talking about two strains, the two main ways that this can happen is, well, one is the sort of what you, what you would expect. So you get somebody who gets infected, 
and then their strain just evolves for whatever reason. It could be due to drug treatment, it could be just, you know, natural evolution. But it's going to evolve and mutate, and then the strain becomes a different strain over time, right? So we start with the yellow strain, and then we end up with the red strain as well. On the other hand, we could also have a situation, especially in uh, areas where there's a lot of reinfection, right, where there's a lot of people who <clears throat> walk around uh, coughing and um, producing tuberculosis um, particles, there is going to be a lot of possibility for a situation like this, where we have an initial strain that's here, but then we get reinfected, so the same person, right, to be mostly affected the lungs, so that's why I have a picture of the lungs here, right? We might have a second strain that comes and reinfects <clears throat> the person from a different infection source, okay? And so the question then becomes, are we able to tell these two situations apart, okay? So we're going to call this situation clonal and this situation multiple strain infection or mixed infection. And before we even talk about how we tell them apart, we can talk about why, right? Why do we care? Well, so there's a few reasons. One is that there's actually a difference in terms of individual treatment outcomes, especially if, you know, the first strain is sensitive to drugs, the second one is resistant to drugs. <clears throat> A situation of global heterogeneity suggests that <clears throat> our treatment is leading to the evolution of drug resistance, right? So the way that we treat the patients is perhaps not appropriate or they're not taking their drugs regularly. It's a long course, so it takes about six to nine months of treatment. So maybe they're not taking their drugs, maybe the drugs are not right. So somehow our bacteria is developing resistance. On the other hand, in a situation like this, we might think about, well, actually, you know, it's not that we're doing anything wrong with the treatment, but there's just a lot of people walking around with resistant strains, and we get <clears throat> other people who get reinfected by these resistant strains. So <clears throat> this influences the outcome of the treatment, and it also gives us some information about disease dynamics, so we can look at things like, okay, so now we have somebody who's infected with two different strains. How do these two strains work together, right? Do they work together? Do they compete with each other? And this is going to then affect the way that we evaluate the impact of interventions. So what I showed you in the first part, right, we were lo looking at the effect of interventions. So taking this kind of information into account can actually change our evaluations. And the question here was for a specific study that was coming out of South Africa, where we had about 500 patients and about 100 of them had complex strains so complex infection, can we differentiate between these two situations? The clonal situation, where the um, two strains are re the result of within-host evolution from mixed infection, where the two strains are the result of multiple infection events. And this is a uh, paper that um, is still in press at the moment. Uh, it's going to appear in PLOS Computational Biology. And there's a companion paper that's going to come out in uh, the Journal of Infectious Diseases. And in basically this work, we're going to try to call this, um, make this decision between mixed and clonal in a principled way. So what is the standard way of doing this? The standard way is pretty simple. So you remember that we have these multiple loci where at every locus we have some copies of the repeat uh, that occurs. And so, Generally speaking, if we don't see any evidence of complexity at any of the loci, then we're just going to say that it's a simple strain, so there's only one strain there, uh, no complexity um, to think about. On the other hand, we could have a situation like this, where there's a single locus that has uh, two different copy number variants that are detected, right? So here we have um, both a one as well as a four copy number situation. And in that case, if it's just one locus that's affected, then we're going to call it a clonal strain. We're going to say that uh, it's the result of within-host evolution. If we have a situation like this, on the other hand, where we have two different loci, two or more, right, multiple loci that are affected by this complexity, so here we have a one and a two in the first and one and two in the second, then we're going to say, okay, these are mixed strains, so there's multiple infection events that happened. Okay. So, <clears throat> What are some opportunities to improve on this? Well, first of all, 
we can notice that the standard method doesn't take into account the number of copies that we actually see. So if we see one copy and two copies, or we see one copy and six copies, we would make the decision the same way, even though it takes a lot longer to evolve from a single copy to six than to evolve from a single copy to two. So that's one disadvantage. That's one limitation. The second limitation is that it doesn't use other strains that we observe in the data. So every strain is basically an island. Every strain gets called on its own. Whereas in reality, we might have a situation like this where there's only one locus that's complex, but we have one other patient in the, in the population that has the same strain with just the one, and we have a third patient with just the four, right? So then if those strains are actually prevalent in the population, then we should be thinking about reinfection here because we actually have um, both of these strains prevalent in the population and it could very well result from reinfection. The third problem is that it's uh, not accounting for any uncertainty that we might have, so we make a hard call, right? It's either clonal or it's mixed. And in reality, we would like to be somewhere in between when there's reason to be somewhere in between. So the main idea for the approach that I developed uh, that is called cluster, so classifying tandem repeats, is the following. When we have uh, multiple complex loci, we actually have an ambiguity in the resolution, which means that in, for instance, this situation where we have one and two in the first locus and one and two in the second locus, there could be two different sets of two strains that are underlying what we observe, right? We could have one strain which is a one and a one, and another which is a two and a two, or we could have one strain which is one and two, and the other which is two and one. And in either case, we would only observe this as the result, right? Our genotyping method does not allow us to resolve this ambiguity. However, we can actually resolve it ourselves in a principled way by making a parsimony assumption. And the parsimony assumption here would basically say we want to include uh, as many strains that we've already seen as possible, as many simple strains that we've already seen, and we want to introduce as few additional strains that we have not observed yet um, as possible. So that's kind of the uh, key idea, and this translates into an optimization problem, which uh, I'm not going to show the exact formulation, but it's uh, fairly straightforward, and then you can solve it using um, uh, integer linear programming. <clears throat> and it's going to look something like this. So here in this data set, we have three strains that are simple and three strains that are complex, and when we resolve the strains that are complex, we're going to use uh, here one of the strains that was simple that we already observed, and another strain that we uh, saw that was simple that we already observed, and then only introduce two strains that we haven't seen before in this population. So in this particular case, this is the best possible uh, solution to this optimization problem, and in fact, this is a unique solution. So we actually know that you know, if our parsimony assumption holds, then this is exactly what's going on. <clears throat> And then once we have this resolution of the um, complex strains into the simple strains, we can use an uh, evolutionary model to classify um, based on how closely uh, each of the um, identified uh, simple strains resembles um, whatever other strains we have in the data. And so we can start uh, thinking about how do we test this method. Well, in order to test this method, we need to have a data set where we have the ground truth. And of course, in the real data, we don't know what actually happened. So we'll have to simulate it, and we'll have to simulate it in a way that's independent from the way that we analyze, right? That's very important. <clears throat> and it's very hard to do, actually. It ha it's very hard to have this sort of intellectual separation if you're designing both <clears throat> the analysis and the you know, the simulation process to be careful to, like, not bias your um, simulation towards um, being favorable <clears throat> for the analysis that you're doing. And so when we uh, simulate data, we see that, in fact, um, the resolution accuracy is very high, so we're able to actually figure out what the underlying simple strains are very well. And we're also able to get a much higher accuracy than the standard method on the classification, so calling uh, things clonal versus mixed, um, <clears throat> we got about 80% accuracy on those um, predictions, whereas the standard method is basically, uh, on this particular simulated data set anyway, is about as good as flipping a coin. 
And then when we analyze the actual data set that we have, so like I told you, 500 uh, patients, of which about 100 have complex strains, we see that about 20% of the data gets reanalyzed in a different way. So the calls on uh, about 20% of the data are different. And we do actually see a few uh, calls that are in between as well. So they're you know, either 25% clonal, 75% mixed, or 50-50. And um, <clears throat> with this approach, we're basically able to much better predict or um, infer whether the infection is actually um, clonal or mixed. One of the ongoing projects that I'm um, thinking about right now is doing the same thing, but in a situation where we have a lot more than two strains. So here we usually have just you know, evidence of two strains being present, but there are some other diseases. Uh, in particular, right now I'm thinking about uh, Lyme disease, which is caused by Borrelia. And Borrelia, you can easily have you know, seven or eight different um, strains within the same uh, vector, so within the same tick. And so how can we disentangle them, and how can we um, figure out where they come from? And now we've talked a little bit about drug resistance. <clears throat> so let's talk about it a little bit more, and let's look into it a little bit more in detail. So drug resistance has been with us ever since antibiotics uh, became available, right? So even penicillin, within a, you know, less than two decades, um, we have seen the emergence of resistance. And pretty much every single antibiotic that we've um, come up with since then has seen resistance. So what is resistance exactly? It's the process by which a pathogen, so bacteria, virus, or whatever, um, fungus, becomes... Um, in re unresponsive to the drug, right? Find ways of circumventing the drug. <clears throat> and so a big question in the um, community is, you know, well, how do we know how much drug we should give our patients so that we not only effectively kill the pathogen, but also prevent the emergence of resistance? And of course, the early um, pioneers of this field, so Paul Ehrlich, who developed this drug for syphilis, uh, Silvarsen, among other things, was that once we're getting to be within host, right, we need to hit hard and we need to hit fast. So large doses and as quickly um, as possible after infection. So in particular, you know, there's this idea of hitting hard and killing resistant mutants. So how hard is hard enough? Right? That's kind of the question, because of course, there's no drug without side effects, and the more drug you give somebody, the more likely they are to have the side effects usually. So you don't want to overdo it, but on the other hand, you don't want to underdo it and just end up with a lot of resistance. So how do you do it? Um, if you give too little drug, then <clears throat> basically the wild type survives, and they're just you know, happily um, chugging along. However, if you give um, a little bit more drug, then it's actually the resistant um, mutants that become more fit, right? And what do we mean by fit? Well, they're basically more adapted. They, they're able to reproduce more. They're able to survive more. <clears throat> and um, we don't want to get into this window, especially, because this is the window where the concentration that we give gives an advantage to the resistant uh, mutants. Because of course, there is a fitness cost, right? You have to change uh, in order to escape the drug. You have to make certain changes. But under normal circumstances, those changes are not favorable, right? They're sort of putting you at a disadvantage. But once the drug is there in high enough concentration, they put you at an advantage. So where we want to be is we want to be over here, <clears throat> where we actually manage to um, kind of prevent all growth of bacteria so we can hit both the wild type and the resistant. And so the question there was, can we develop a mechanistic model that would help us predict the concentration of antibiotic that's necessary to prevent the emergence of resistance without necessarily knowing which specific resistance mechanism um, the pathogen might use? So kind of being a little bit uh, broader and being a little bit more conservative and this is something that is still in preparation. It's a um, mechanistic model that I'm going to show you uh, in collaboration with um, uh, Pia Abelzurich. So 
what does it look like? Well, it looks like a way of closing this gap between, on the one hand, something that we know fairly well, which is the different mechanisms of antibiotic action, and on the other hand, again, something that we know fairly well, the bacterial population biology. But what comes in between is this cellular level, right? So what happens at the level of a single cell? Well, at the level of a single cell, there are targets, and there are drug molecules that bind these targets. And so we can go from here to here using systems biology. We can go from here to here uh, using population biology. But ideally, we would want to bridge that gap uh, between the two things. And so how we can do it is actually, it turns out, with very few assumptions. So there's not a whole lot of detailed work that we need to do. The only thing that we need to assume is that there is a certain number of target molecules within the cell. There are um, reactions that basically are reversible. So there is a uh, kinetic constant for um, attaching to the target, for the drug to attach to the target. So red uh, circles are drugs. And um, there is a certain rate for basically detaching from the target. And then there is a diffusion process that happens between the cell and the extracellular medium. And the more targets that are bound, the more likely we are to uh, kill the cell. And the less likely it is to replicate. Okay? And then furthermore, we assume that the concentration within the cell of target molecules is going to stay constant between uh, divisions. So this is not always true, but we do know that it's true for ribosomes, among other things. So how do we then translate this into a particular set of conclusions? Well, we need to think about what are the different ways by which um, um, pathogens, so let's say bacteria, develop resistance to drugs. And some of them are by playing with the affinity, so making sure that the targets are less um, um, likely to bind um, with the drug. Affecting the intracellular drug concentration, so pumping out a lot of drug is another way. Decreasing the number of target molecules that are going to be presented. Or uh, varying the killing threshold. So this is something that, has, that help, uh, happens downstream. So basically being able to sustain more uh, bound targets before um, feeling an effect. And from all of those different mechanisms, we would like to be able to ca calculate something called a minimal inhibitory concentration. So the smallest number that is not only going to um, hit the uh, wild type, but also the resistant population and prevent all growth. So inhibit growth. And this is some um, early results from this. Uh, so just looking at the drug target affinity, and trying to look at the correlation um, between what the model predicts and what is actually measured, uh, we see that there's actually a very uh, strong correlation between those two things, even though there's actually fairly few assumptions that went into the model. And the way that this is actually calculated, again, I'm not going into details too much, but there's a number of compartments that are um, labeled by the number of target molecules that are bound. And you can construct a linear system um, which describes the time evolution of the um, population. And then you can basically look at the concentration at which the overall population eventually declines, which is equivalent to saying that uh, all the eigenvalues of this, um, um, I guess, forcing matrix for this linear system are going to have negative real part. So <clears throat> a sample of other projects that I have going on right now um, I've spent quite a bit of uh, time thinking about metabolic models, and um, one of the things that I'm really interested in doing is uh, modeling metabolism better. So metabolism is just what happens within the cell in terms of exchanges of uh, different nutrients with the medium and then the production of all the different things that the pathogen needs to grow and reproduce. And how can we identify weak spots in metabolism to potentially develop new drug targets? Because given that we have a lot of resistance, we need to be able to find new drug targets to um, hit so that um, we stave off um, the emergence of you know, large-scale resistance. <clears throat>
there's also some work on lineage classification that I'm doing, so figuring out where the pathogen comes from based on its molecular signature. So again, looking at these copy numbers and trying to figure out, okay, uh, you know, is this a Beijing strain? Is this a strain from uh, the Mediterranean? Is this a strain from um, um, North America and so on? And um, that's actually a pretty interesting um, project that involves a lot of uh, machine learning and um, other uh, cool techniques. There's also looking at resistance mechanisms. So this is a project that I currently have going on uh, with uh, Fung, who's in the audience. And we're trying to figure out a way to decide if a particular resi uh, resistant infection has been um, the result of the acquisition, so the result of uh, primary um, care causing um, resistance or has been the result of transmission. So a little bit like um, the um, complex infection project that I talked about, but specifically targeting resistance and looking at a large population to try to understand this question in a data-driven way. And finally, there's uh, some work that I'm doing on the health policy level, so you know, very different scales, uh, starting from very low to basically very, very large. Um, and one of the questions there is how can we improve the engagement of the private sector? And this is particularly relevant for uh, countries like India, where the private sector plays a huge role in the uh, healthcare system. Um, not so much, let's say, Canada. And how can we create these incentives by uh, basing payment on outcome rather than basing it on just, you know, delivery of the service. And that involves a lot of game theory and um, other cool things. So this is my kind of vision for what I want to do in the long run, right? And this again, using the example of tuberculosis, but um, you could do this with any, any pathogen really. So there's so many different things to model, right? There's the molecule itself that is going to affect um, the pathogen, so it could be a drug molecule, then what happens at the level of a single cell? What happens at the level of a tissue? What happens at the level of a host, an entire host? And then what happens at the level of an entire population? And there's all these different interactions between these levels, and ideally what I would be interested in is building something that can actually have this sort of infrastructure where we can actually communicate between these different levels and use all the different <clears throat> sources of data, all the heterogeneity in the data, you know, no matter where it comes from, in order to answer um, questions about the overall process of um, infection and eventually, you know, uh, contribute towards controlling and perhaps even eradicating for some of the diseases. So with that, I'll just um, mention my uh, numerous collaborators um, who have been extremely helpful because, of course, you know, none of this would have been possible without um, their participation. And I just want to finish with a little plug. So, um, as you know, at um, SFU we have this really awesome program that uh, Cedric is also part of that's called MadGen. Um, I currently have a pretty small group, so Fung, who's here in the audience, and also Nithin, who's a postdoc. Uh, but I'm always looking for more um, talented and uh, motivated masters uh, or doctoral students to join. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I would love to hear any questions, comments. Yeah, please. Thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I actually was able to prove that the um, uh, optimization problem is NP-hard. I didn't show the reduction, but I have it in my extra slides if you're interested. And then, basically, it is a combinatorial optimization problem, but, um, you know, given that it's a NP-hard problem, it seemed reasonable to just do it with uh, and encoding as an integer linear program and then just throwing cplex at it and uh, trying to make sense of what it does, right? So that, that, that's, that's currently the pipeline. In fact, the pipeline is going to be exposed uh, to the public as soon as the uh, paper is published. So you'll be able to submit your own data sets if you like to try to do this kind of analysis. Yes, go ahead. Uh, 
Yes, it does. So there's a there's a there's sort of a wrinkle that I didn't show, which is that usually we got multiple solutions that are optimal. So the example that I showed it has only one one optimal solution, but generally there's multiple. And so then you need to use an evolutionary model to kind of select between them, and that uses uh, something that I call the well something that's usually called the minimum description length principle. So if you formulate it with that, um, then it actually allows you to narrow down the solutions to like just a, a handful uh, from potentially a very large number. And so yeah, so it does use you know evolutionary um, evolutionary model to uh, kind of narrow down the set of um, solutions, and then it also uses the evolutionary model to ultimately come up with a classification as clonal or mixed. Yeah, Libria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's that's exactly what it, that that's exactly the minimum description length uh, where it comes in. So basically, I say that it is more advantageous to use a strain that I've seen a lot of times than to use a strain that I've only seen once or twice, right? And that's uh, so basically the frequencies of the strains that I observe in the population are built into the into the optimization. Correct. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And when we, you know, we do see up to like 12 uh, complex loci, so that gives us over 2,000 different possibilities. So it's not, you know, it's it, it's not a sort of straightforward uh, optimization problem. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, um, no, it's just, so in real life we don't, uh, I, I think you're talking about this slide here. Yeah. So this is the results on, on real data. And this is, these are actually numbers, right? So this is, so basically there are 42 strains that the standard method calls clonal that we also call clonal. And then there's 32 strains that we call mixed and the standard method calls mixed. And those are the ones that are, are different. So there's 18 out of 92 that are different, right? That we have a different classification from the standard method. Um, we don't know how accurate this is, right? Because we don't, we, we haven't observed what actually happened. We haven't observed whether these uh, infections were the result of multiple infection events or the result of within host evolution for the real data, for the simulated data we know, right? So those here are percentages, but here it's just actual pure numbers, if that makes sense. So I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry if that was a little bit confusing. Uh, so say, say again, for simulated data, you have to have a better prediction. Yeah, I mean, we, so we, we don't we don't know we don't have ground truth here, right? This is this is the so in real in the real data we don't have ground truth. In the simulated data we do. So in simulated data we can evaluate accuracy. Here we can just evaluate agreement between our method and the standard method, and we see that there's a fair amount of disagreement. So that's that's so the upshot of this is that uh, of this slide is that not only do we do better, substantially better on simulated data in terms of accuracy, but there's also a substantial discrepancy between our predictions and the predictions that you would get from the usual method, the standard method, on real data, where we don't know the ground truth. It's a great question. Thanks. Uh, yeah, is it, yeah. <laughs> I looked at this and actually, you can't tell what's true, but this makes sense. Like intuitively, it makes sense because your method, there's 12 samples where the standard method is just saying, oh, it's okay, so the infection here. Right. But you're saying you're in the expectation. Correct. But there's substantially fewer where it goes the other way around. That's correct. Right. Yes. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. That is true. Yes. Of course. That is absolutely true. And in fact, so, right, so in this data set, uh, in this study, right, we saw about 20%, so 20% of the hosts had a complex infection as detected by near the NTR. But there's a, a, a recent paper that came out by uh, some of my colleagues that basically suggests that looking at just the near the NTR, substantially under calls the amount of complexity that there is, right? So we can only deal with the complexity that is detected by Miriam, but there could be a lot more going on sort of behind the scenes that's just not affecting the copy numbers and that, or the microsatellite regions. And that is absolutely, absolutely uh, valid uh, as well, definitely. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I started thinking about it a little bit. I unfortunately know virtually nothing about cancer, so I, you know, if, if uh, I, I'm sure many of you here do. So I would love to talk more about it. And I think that there's some interesting applications to basically, you know, looking at tumor heterogeneity and trying to kind of um, figure out where the heterogeneity is coming from, like what is the, you know, what is the evolutionary history of that heterogeneity that we observe. And I think some of these, you know, maybe not necessarily exactly the same approach, but some of, this, some, some of those ideas might be, uh, you know, valuable there. And, and conversely, you know, ideas from cancer could be applied here. So for sure. That's a good point. All right, let's eat. Thanks.